Okay, so we have two of our four panelists are here at the moment. So I think maybe we'll just start with the two people we have and then move on. Um, so I'm sorry that I wasn't here to meet you all earlier today. Um, my name is Laura Muller and I'm program director for undergraduate in STEM education at the Jackson Laboratory. And this is my first year being involved in the science fair. And one of the things that I heard the judges talking about is things that they would like to see. So today what we've done is we've invited um, four judges, two of whom are here at the moment, to talk a little bit about um, some things that they saw in projects and some things that they would like you as teachers to know about the judging process. And so I've asked them, um, it says five questions here, but the first question is that they should introduce themselves. I've asked them four questions that I put in the, the chat. Um, so what are the questions you ask students you wish they had answered better or more completely? What are some of the most common missteps you see students do in their science fair work? What are the characteristics of student interviews that make it difficult for you to move on to the next interview? And if you had one piece of global advice, what would that be? And so um, I've asked them to each speak for about five minutes. Um, and then for um, at that point, at the end of that time, we'll have time for questions. And so Aisha and Frank, since you're the, for the people who are here right now, um, I would say that you can take a little bit more than five minutes. And why don't we start um, with Aisha, if you would like to go first, could you introduce yourself and um, then answer the questions since you had them in advance to prepare a statement? Hey, uh, my name is Aisha Malival Bandi. I am a lecturer in mathematics at the University of Maine. And I really should have read my email a little better because I did not see I had five minutes. So I, and I generally talk a lot. So I was like trying to yeah. cut down and make sure I don't talk too much. Um, I have been judging at uh, the Maine State Science Fair. I can't remember like four or five years now. But it has been an amazing experience throughout, like both when it was uh, live and when it was virtual, it has been really, uh, it's amazing to see the work that students are putting in. So some of the questions that you ask students that, uh, like I wish that they would answer better or more clearly, I think like, you know, you'll see a common theme in what my all my statements are, which is basically that I think it is, uh, when you're looking at projects, it's really, hard sometimes to understand what is the individual work of the students and what is work that has been said to them that they worked in a team together or that they have worked with other people in. And uh, this in particular, like with math, mathematics and computer science and code codes, it comes up a lot because like, you know, there are codes available and it's really hard to see what, uh, how much, like, you know, what in there is the student work? And sometimes, like, you know, when I ask that question, just to get a better understanding, obviously not like directly, but like, you know, I try and understand what was their input to it. It is not exactly always very clear. So that is something that I do wish that students uh, would answer more completely. And some of the common missteps I see them making in their work for uh, MSSF. It would be, again, along this uh, similar line that like their research methodology sometimes, I, I know they're like, you know, really eager to present their results because they've worked so hard. And so sometimes it skips some of these ideas of how did they, so for instance, if they did a survey, sometimes, you know, they may not put in all the information about how did the survey happen? Why did they choose the questions they did? What was their survey population? What was uh, what were they looking to find? And they'll often, you know, illustrate the results, which is great. But sometimes it's also like, you know, you want to know why did they come up with that project, or what led them down that particular path that uh, we are at. And uh, so, characteristics of student interviews that make it difficult for me. I get, I mean, like one, it is that it's so interesting and there is like always such uh, less time. You want to ask them so many questions and you want to know all about what they're doing. So I guess, but that's not their fault. Uh, it's just a time issue. Again, like, you know, uh, sometimes it's, it's, there's a lot of, uh, I found that like there's uh, sometimes a lot of discrepancy and that kind of makes it uh, hard to fairly judge in the sense you'll have students who would be very, 
forthcoming with like exactly what they did and if, uh, like all the information. And then there is other, stu uh, other students who may like, you know, uh, try and just like cover what they think is the basic idea. But again, it sometimes le like it's it's hard to then compare. Uh, it feels like comparing apples and oranges in some ways because you know you're like comparing a lot of in-depth information versus uh, information that is like you know more uh, superficial. I would say, and so I guess like you know, it ties into my advice would be that obviously they should practice and like you know make sure that it is well within time but as much information as they can provide, as much as they can talk about and make it almost like a story, the, their project, because when uh, people who are seeing it for the first time, they may not know why they did this, what motivated them. Sometimes that story is in fact, even more interesting. That process is even more interesting than the actual project itself, like actual outcome itself. So I would say that like, you know, don't hesitate to tell that story just know that you know we are there to listen to you and we are excited and we are you know uh, excited to hear what you have to share and so that would be my advice thank you very much that those that's great insight i think we'll hold all the questions till the end just so that we can like see that and so uh frank um dudish from um also from the university of maine will, will speak next good afternoon everyone I hope you are well. Uh, my name is Frank. I teach physics and astronomy at the University of Maine. Uh, the University of Maine has eight judges who uh, decide uh, who, who gets the University of Maine scholarships, at the University of Maine, and access to the Honors College. Uh, and I'm the lead judge for those judges. I have uploaded a PDF into the chat. Um, what I did was I asked uh, all the Maine judges what what kind of, what advice would they like to share? What would be useful? Um, and I figured rather than make you write things down, I would just give it to you as a PDF. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so you can see globally, we ask students about every aspect of their project and what they, and what they work on. And uh, to Laura's questions, uh, um, what are the characteristics of student interviews that make it difficult for you to move on to your next interview? None. We have to get through a whole bunch of students and we have maybe 10, 15 minutes with each student and we move on. So if a student can't explain uh, their project and they're kind of lost and they don't have it, we gotta move on because the next student is gonna be really good. So uh, when, we, when we gather to make our final decision, the thought we put in our heads is who, because these students, we're, we're inviting them to University of Maine, we're inviting them to the Honors College, we're inviting them to do research. What we ask ourselves is, who would you like on your research team? Who would you like to be working with? With that, I'm going to let you ask me any questions you have about the PDF. And I can share a screen if that makes it easier. Frank, could you give us um, an example of a project that was like creative or original that sort of stands out in your mind? Uh, I, I would say go to the Maine State Science Fair's website and look at the previous year's scholarship winners uh, because the projects have been, all have been original and creative and outstanding. Um, whether they're doing an analysis of uh, critters living in a lake or they're building an exoskeleton or they're 3D printing a better 3D printer, uh, mm -hmm. the the things that stand out to us are, are things are projects that students have ownership of. They've gotten excited about that. They, they are, they are personally invested in this and they are curious themselves about it. Hi, I've never uh, been to the actual 
fair is um could you just tell me sort of what the layout is is there are you walking to each poster with a group of judges or um so yeah uh, uh stephanie and, and laura will they yes. they kind of set up the the uh fair uh and it, it it varies the setup varies depending a little bit on where it is uh because it, there are of course space questions but in in general students have a have a position and uh what we do is we assign two or three judges to interview uh, each student that we're interested about. So the, the students submit their abstract and kind of their projects. We, we read what they've done. Based on that, we winnow down our pool to the students that we want to interview. And then we select at least two of us to interview those students. And then that determines how much time we have. And it's often on the 10 to 15 minute range. And and they the the judges um, Frank's speaking about the scholarships, but it works the same way for the other categories. So each category has a group of judges assigned to that category, and Rebecca works with them in the morning so that the judges decide who's going to do interview which people. And I, there's the number minimum is two. Rebecca, two interviews per student, two or three, um, two, three. and two or three. Yeah. And so that the so a group of judges will they may go together they may go separately but they try to inter they inter try to make sure that every student gets at least two interviews from a set of judges and so we have an hour and a half of judging hour and 15 minutes of judging and then a break and then another period for judging and so the students know which period is actually their judging period and which period is their period to go um see other presentations and um, the judges get a break between them so that they can talk about which projects they liked while it's fresh in their mind. So they're not trying to think about the entire category, especially in the large category like biological sciences, let's say. Um, so Frank, if you'll take the screen share down, I think this is very helpful. We might put it up in a second, but why don't we hear, uh, we might put it up later. Why don't we hear from Jim Crowley, who actually gave me this idea when we were at Colby this year. Um, about uh, his thoughts. And he and I talked a, a little bit about what made projects um, interesting. And so Jim, will you speak next? Sure, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, mm -hmm. I have mixed results with Zoom on my computer. Sometimes yeah. it really doesn't work so well, mm -hmm. but if it's working, great. Uh, my name is Jim Crowley. I am with the Department of Environmental Protection. I work in the Division of Water Quality Management. We license wastewater treatment facilities, both public and private ones throughout the state. Uh, I'm involved in that. I'm involved with compliance with these facilities. I'm involved with uh, technical assistance to these facilities, state pretreatment program, a whole range of different things. And I'm currently into my nose in developing the program that we're about to engage in to start doing PFAS testing uh, in wastewater plant discharges. Uh, so I, I'm very, very much versed in, uh, in what happens with wastewater treatment and discharges in Maine. Uh, although I came to the DEP in 2003 as an enforcement employee and moved into what I'm doing uh, in 2006. And before that, I spent 25 years in various uh, industrial chemical activities, uh, biopharmaceutical manufacturing, photochemical, uh, manufacturing and technology back when pictures were taken on film a long, long time ago, and the pulp and paper industry in the state of Maine for 19 years mm -hmm. as an environmental health and safety manager. So I have kind of a, a wide variety of backgrounds. Uh, I've been judging, my, my education is in chemistry and in business. Uh, my, I've been judging since, oh, back since the days when the Maine Principals Association ran this show. So I've, I've been at it probably for since 2006 or 2007 or so. Uh, and I enjoy every bit of it. I absolutely enjoy working with kids. I think it's a, an incredibly important thing for kids to be introduced to in a very positive and very motivating way. All the STEM issues, I, 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 <laughs> I subjected my own children to that. And, and now I've got a doctorate in biochemistry and a, a master's in environmental engineering uh, so it actually kind of hit home and they they like it and uh, and I, I kind of like to see that I like to see that spark in kids too and uh, to get to to the points that I made here uh, I've, I've 
I have the same rubric that you presented that you sent out in the email, mm -hmm. but I think everybody is going to touch on it. And I'm, I'm not going to be too formalized about sticking to the questions in the order that they occur, but there are some important things I'd like to do, or I'd like to bring up. Um, and one of them is that one of the most important things about this process is that it should help inculcate the scientific method into students. Okay. And that doesn't mean that the success that their experiments always, or their projects always succeed. And it doesn't mean that they necessarily made any right assumptions or wrong assumptions for that matter, but that they follow a scientific method doing what they're doing. And that's just like any skill set, learning how to play the piano, learning a sport, uh, developing a scientific method is not necessarily intuitive. And it really has to be inculcated in kids if they're going to become good scientists, technicians, engineers. Uh, it, it's, it's important. And I've, I look for that in everything that I see uh, in the science fair. And some specifics in that direction that I think that the uh, teachers and the sponsors of the students should be aware of and should work towards when they're working with their kids. Uh, uh, just, I have, I have a, a slight list here. Uh, first off, the kids should do something that they're interested in. They shouldn't just be, well, I, I've, I need to do or I have to do, but I really want to do a project for the science fair, but not just pick something out of a book somewhere. Whatever the kid has inside them that's driving them to be interested in a, in a scientific endeavor should be the driver that brings them to a project that they can connect with. And I think that's very important for them to have the enthusiasm and to apply themselves the way they really should uh, to be successful at this. Uh, and the other part of that is not only should it be something that they're really willing to and ready to engage in, but it should be something that ultimately is trying to get to a useful or somehow beneficial point or determination. You know, how, how many, how far you can throw a lacrosse ball with a contraption or uh, how long it takes a candle to burn down or something like that. Okay, perhaps some interesting stuff there. But it really doesn't get at anything that's that's potentially uh, uh, earth shattering. <laughs> Let's mm -hmm. call it that. Although that's an extreme, we don't expect too much that's earth shattering. Although I've been very, very pleasantly impressed with some of the things I have seen. Uh, but I think that the kids should be aiming for something that is intrinsically valuable. With my own kids, I used to say, "Is it true, useful, or beautiful?" or a combination of all or any of those three things. It's got to fit some of that. And I think the same thing is true with these projects. Some things are, are you can see they have intrinsic value, other things, not so much. Okay, and then uh, another point I would make is that, uh, and this is, this is just a, 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 a detail of the abstracts that we get are oftentimes really sketchy. Okay, some of them are good, some of them are okay, some of them are really sketchy. And the fact is, and I know this from personal experience and from the experience of, of uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago, my daughter defended her dissertation uh, for her biochemistry doctorate. And she, one of the things that she was good at amongst many things was being able to get grants, to write proposals for grants. Very important in science and engineering uh, that you know how to present an abstract that is a really effective executive summary of what you're doing and that grabs the reader. If you present an abstract that, that looks like you didn't really care, you had to do it, so you sort of did it, you, didn't have, you don't even have correct spelling or grammar sometimes, and it doesn't grab the reader, you're missing something that's actually part of a really important part of the toolkit of future scientists, engineers, and technicians. Because the, the, a lot of what will happen in their education and in their profession will have to do with how well they can convince other people to pay attention and listen to them and how well they can get people to send them funding for the things that they're going to want to be doing. That, that, that I, I can't stress that enough. Okay, that's an important tool in the toolkit. So the abstract, it should not be just like, a, oh, yep, there's that. Okay, we'll put that aside now on with the rest. It actually is a very functional thing in itself. 
and, and a good scientist should be a well-developed skill. Uh, again, these project, projects, and I've, it's already been brought up, I don't believe they should necessarily rehash the known. I mean, you can do, you can do literature searches. Anybody can, well, that's a, that's a skill too. And it's a valuable skill and it's important for something. But it shouldn't be a literature search that you take a proven principle and prove it again. Uh, it's nice. You might do a very good job of doing that. But I'm looking for something new and different and original and creative out of these kids. And I think that is something that the, the teachers should also help aim, or teachers and parents uh, should help aim their students toward. Don't just redo something. You know, don't make a circuit, make a light bulb come on. Great, wonderful circuit, great handicraft, but you haven't done anything original and you haven't really shown that you looked at something, you've kind of analyzed it, you've used the scientific method to approach a hypothesis and proven or disproven it, and why, and demonstrated that. So it, that's, that's something I think that all the teachers involved in this with their students should be pushing them towards. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, an, I'm old school, you know, when I first was doing science and running instrumentation and stuff like that, there were no such things as personal computers. You know, they, they, they didn't exist. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an old school chemist, a bench chemist. I've done instrumentation, but everything I did was in writing. So one thing I like to see when I see the students do their work, along with their board and their presentation, is their workbook or their journal. And I'm okay if it's electronic. If they want to keep it that way, that's fine. But I want to see what they actually used as a tool while they were going through their efforts. And this is also part of the scientific method, because I'm really impressed by somebody who used their workbook and journal for the purposes that they should be, taking that, putting thoughts down, working through things on paper, writing information down, analyzing it, maybe breaking down the hypothesis a little bit, analyzing it again. I want to see this ruffled. I want to see it dirty. I don't mind if there's a little soda stain in the corner or something like that. But it want to, I want to look for something that shows me that the student actually used this for what I would think the intent should be, as opposed to just say, oh, I have to put something together because they tell me as part of the rubric, I have to have a workbook. And I see that a lot. And where, where, where all the writing in the book is done at one time. <laughs> But it's just like completely uniform from start to finish. And it's once. And it's kind of clear that that was not happening as the process was going along. So I think I've taken up enough time. But those, those, are, some, those are some of the critical things that I look for when I judge projects. OK. Thank you, Jim. And our, our fourth speaker actually didn't hasn't joined the Zoom. So um, what I'm going to say is that what I heard is, is that the storytelling piece of the interview is a really important thing. And understanding how the project is important to, to the students is an important thing. We heard that from all three judges in different ways. Um, Frank's document actually says that the students should display a sense of ownership. But Aisha said it as if like it has to be something that the student um, the student has to tell why they came to that project and how they're working on it. And Jim, Jim talked about it wanting to the student to be able to um, articulate what they were thinking, where their question came from, and then how using the scientific method they kept moving through that question. Um, and so I think Frank's, Frank's document actually, without my having to do it, gave you gives you a good summary of some of the pieces that need to that that Jim has touched on and that you should have touched on earlier. So I really appreciate that. I wonder if you all um, have any questions for the judges um, who are here joining us today about what they're looking for or about um, how judging happens or anything having to do with working with your students around these pro science fair projects. Wow. Don't be shy. We couldn't have done that good a job. <laughs> I think that means Laura and Stephanie did a very good job kind of providing information. 
Yeah, um, thank you all for joining us. I, I do want to thank you both for joining us today and taking some time out of your summertime, but also I want to thank you for being with us as judges for a long time because that matters to us. And I think that's one of the things that makes our program st as strong as it is, is that the judges keep coming back and it adds consistency and calibration to our pro program so that, that um, our more experienced judges, our more seasoned judges can help train the judges who are new to the program and um, help everybody understand what a science fair project in Maine should look like, which has helped our students do well at um, the Regeneron and the International Science Fair. Um, okay, questions. You're, I do have one question. Sure. Um, so I know this year in, that we sent in the abstracts prior to the Maine State Science Fair. Were, are those abstracts, are those reviewed as part of the process in the judging prior to, okay. I'm yes, they that. are. They are reviewed prior. They're to help the judges. They help the judges in two ways. It helps give them an idea of what questions to ask your student when they go there, right? But it also helps, like, so I said that the judge team for each category meets before they do the judging. And so they'll read those and say like, oh, I have a little bit more expertise in this area. So I wanna go see these, these three students in this category. And another judge will say, oh, I have a little bit more expertise in this area. So it helps us make the judging more complete so that your student doesn't end up with a judge who really doesn't have any idea what kinds of questions to ask. Gotcha. We usually get copies of those uh, via email, probably two weeks, uh, 10 days at the least in advance. So we have a we have a good shot at them ahead of time, and we have an idea of what we're getting into. Andrew, I would add that the Humane Scholarship judges use the abstracts to decide who we're going to interview. Gotcha. Okay. So if an if an abstract is very poor, then we don't interview that student. Gotcha. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add to what um, James said. Um, the science fair part is new to me, but I've been teaching. Um, high school physics for a while. And like him, I was a technical professional before that. And in, in doing lab reports, the one thing I'm stressing to them, the phrase I use is, it's my personal quest to get you to write a good abstract. Mm -hmm. In your technical career, you'll do your own literature search and you'll get like, you know, 20 hits, but you're not gonna read 20 papers, but you will read 20 abstracts and a good abstract will hook you. So it's the reverse of what you were saying of you trying to hook a potential source of funds, their, their abstract is trying to hook a reader of their paper, or they're trying to read a paper with a good hook on it. Yeah, and trying to get the idea of what a good abstract should have in it. You know, not an introduction, not like, you know, Galileo once said, no, I don't care about that. You know, <laughs> let's get to what you did, you know? <laughs> so, that's good, I'm glad to hear that. I wrote all that down to retell them to this year. <laughs> Um, before we go, I'd just like to add one more pitch, and that is that all three of the judges said that they would like to hear the students practice a little bit more and be able to explain their project a little bit better. Um, and so the pitch I want to give is that Carrie last year did Zoom office hours in the evenings for the students to go to, and Carrie will happily practice with them if you feel like they need practice that isn't you anymore. Um, I hope I'm not volunteering him for something he doesn't want to do, but but I think when you hear from Abby later that you'll hear some of that information. So um, thank you, Jim and Frank and Aisha for joining us today. We we're really grateful to see you and I think it's time to move on to the next segment. Stephanie, is that right? Great. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.